Hello everyone. In this lecture, we will be discussing NAT or Network Address Translation. Now, we already talked about IP addresses, we've talked about subnets and we've talked about DHCP. In this lecture, we'll be focusing on NAT. But in, in reality, how an, what happens is all datagrams that leave a local network usually have a same a single IP address called the NAT IP address. So let's look at this example here. In this uh, example, the local network has an IP address starting with 10.0.0.0 with, <coughs> with the subnet as backslash 24. So all IP addresses are going to start with 10.0.0 here. So the all these networks for all these computers here have, for example, this one has 10.0.0.1, 0.2 and so on. The router has an uh, the IP address of the in incoming interface of the router of this interface of the router has 10.0.0.4. However, the other interface of the router has an IP address 138.76.29.7. Now, all datagrams that leave this network, this local network out here, are going to use this particular IP address 138.76.29.7. So. What happens is all these different IP addresses are going to be mapped to this particular IP address and this is what we call as network address translation so we'll <clears throat> and we'll get into the into these details in this lecture today but first why do we need network address translation the reason is you just for the rest of the world you you can use only a single IP address so that all the hosts that are connected in within the local network have different IP addresses but for the rest of the world you have you you know only one IP address as a result you need to purchase only few IP addresses from the ISP which is monetarily beneficial and you could use local IP addresses within your network next you could change IP addresses within your local network without notifying the rest of the world you could change any, anything within your network but for the rest of the world you have giving only a single IP address so you could do that next other thing is the number of IP addresses in this world are actually limited. We are using 32 bits for IP addresses and the number of devices that are connected to the internet today are far more than 2 to the power 32. So we need this kind of NATing. And other thing is NATing provides security because the because computers within connected within a network are not directly accessible. They're only accessible via the NAT. So those addresses are not available to the general public so you don't know what the address of a particular computer is and so they provide security okay so having given this more having given this motivation let's look at how NAT is implemented the way it is implemented is the source IP and port is going of every outgoing datagram is going to be replaced with a NAT IP and a new port and then this, this is how the datagram is going to be sent and then the, in the NAT address translation table there is this mapping is going to be saved. This mapping between the source IP address and the port and the NAT IP address and new port is going to be saved. So basically in the NAT address table you will have every, you will have these kind of entries having the source IP address and the port number and the NAT IP address and the new port number. Okay so whenever <coughs> next whenever there are incoming datagrams for Host within the local, uh, within the local network, what's going to happen is they're going to be addressed with a NAT IP address and uh, and this particular new port, right? What you have, to, what the NAT would do, it would look at this NAT NAT translation table and figure out the source IP address and the port for the incoming datagram, and then it would then send it to that particular host within that local network. Okay, so let's look at a live example. So here, the here this is the subnet. And there is this router here where the NAT table is implemented, and this is the, <clears throat> the address that is of the router that's known to the outside world. Okay, so first, let's assume this client here 10.0.0.1 is sending something to a destination. Its IP address is 128.119.40.186 at port 80. So by using port 80, note that this is an HTTP connection. So once this datagram is going out. What happens is this router in the middle is going to send the datagram by replacing it with the NAT address and another port. For example, the NAT address is uh, the NAT IP address is 138.76.29.7. That's what is put as a source, and then the, uh, a new port is assigned. 
And then there is this, what it does is this router in the NAT address translation table, it puts this entry and <clears throat> before sending this datagram out. Now, when a response comes back, the response is going to be addressed to, to 138.76.29.7. That is this, that is the IP address of this interface or the NAT IP address. And with that particular port, which is 5001. When this Inca, when this, once this uh, datagram comes in, what and this router is going to do is going to consult this NAT. It's going to consult this NAT and then figure out that something that's addressed to itself with uh, and port 5001 is actually addressed to this particular host, which is 10.0.0.1 with uh, port 3345. So it's going to just send that to that port. This is how the network address translation works. Next, <clears throat> a few things. One is the port field is actually 16 bit long. So there are, it could, uh, so there could be simultaneously 60,000 connections with a single side, single LAN side address. So that is because of the 16 bit, uh, bits that are used for ports, a large number of connections can be sustained. The other thing that I want to mention is NAT is somehow controversial. For example, routers should only process up to the layer three right because there is this distinction among the different layers and routers should technically process only up to layer 3 but currently using NAT what you're doing is routers are looking at the port number which is something in layer 4 which is the transport layer so it's kind of violates the end-to-end -end argument and that is some and that is something which is controversial about NAT the way the shortage of IP addresses should actually address is using IPv6, but unfortunately, till date, IPv6 implementation has been limited. Okay, the next uh, issue question that you would want to ask with that is say, how does a client which is outside a network connect to a server which is behind a NAT? So, this client here wants to connect to the server which is behind the NAT, it cannot connect to 10.0.0.1 because that's the address that's a local IP address then how does it go about doing this? So the client can, what this client can do, it can only connect to the NAT IP address, which is 138.76.29.7. But then that would only help it connect to this NAT router. How is it going to get to this uh, server out here? But I have one possible solution is that you can statically configure the NAT to forward incoming requests to the to given, to at a given port and to, to the server, to this particular server, for example, Everything that is say <clears throat> that is say comes for to 123.76.29.7. Here, <clears throat> this is another IP address. You could also consider it as 138.76.29.7 to port 2500 is actually forwarded to this particular server, which is 10.0.0.1 at port 2500. Okay, so you can just statically configure the NAT. Of course, we don't want to statically configure because there are issues with static configuration. Every time you change the IP address of the server or say you have additional servers, you have to go in and add those entries in the NATing table. The, another way to get around this problem uh, is to use the universal plug and play protocol, which learns IP addresses and helps <coughs> And populates an entries in the NATing table automatically. So it's not a static configuration. It is similar to DHCP. It has the same flavor as DHCP, like it is kind of dynamic and it does it, uh, it does it on its own without much human intervention. Okay. So with this, I'll stop and I'll uh, conclude our discussion on that. Thank you.